Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to establishing true democracy and creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Our guest today is Kristen Eberhardt, senior researcher with uh, Sightline Institute based in Seattle. Sightline Institute tells us they are committed to making the Northwest a global model for, of sustainability with strong communities, a green economy, and a healthy environment. So welcome to our program. Thank you. Great, yeah. So uh, as I was reading that uh, little statement, uh, I um, reflected that it's really pretty close to the uh, mission statement for the Alliance for yes. Democracy, right? Yeah. yeah. So so uh, I'm expecting a good conversation today. Good. Right, yeah. So, but you've been focused, well, well let's tell us a little bit more about Sightline. When did it start? What does it do? What's the objectives? And what's your role there? Yeah, Sightline's been around for 25 years. So we are based around the bioregion of Cascadia. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, a little bit of Idaho, um, which is a, a, a watershed and a bioregion. It was formed 25 years ago by Alan Durning, who came from World Watch Institute mm -hmm. and decided to focus on where he had come from, which is Seattle and this, this region. So we work, all, over those 25 years, we've worked on various issues related to making the Northwest sustainable. And in the last five years, we have realized that everything we work on is hindered when our democracy doesn't work well. Mm -hmm. So we have been, for about five years, working on how, what can we do to make democracy work for people. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's where you come in. That's, and that's, that's your where main I come focus, in, right? yeah. Yeah, excellent, good. And, and, and you live here in Portland? I live in Portland. Okay, which is uh, really to our benefit, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, so, um, what we wanted to focus on, you, uh, you wrote a series of articles on how archaic election me uh, methods can cripple democracy, and um, and you did one about that was titled something like Seven Questions on How to Change Portland's City Government," um, and you talk about Portland's quirky commissioner system. Yeah. What's quirky about it? Well, just that it's um, most cities have moved away from it. It was a a, a sort of an Thing that cities experimented with at the beginning of the 20th century, thinking maybe we can streamline processes if we combine the executive and the legislative branches, that you know things will just get done faster. It was actually originally implemented in Galveston, Texas, mm. in response to a, a natural disaster, a flood. And they said, oh, we need to have a quick response to this, and maybe we would be able to have a faster response if our, our government had the legislative and the executive branches uh, combined. But since then, most cities in the U.S. have moved away from it because they found it, it didn't work out that well for them. And Portland is the biggest city, for sure, and, and one of just a handful of cities in the United States that still uses it. Hmm. Okay. All right. And, and so, uh, how do you feel it has actually worked in Portland, or, or what, what's the, what's the uh, negative implications for government in Portland by having the commission system. Yeah, and there there are people who still really you know like the commissioner system in Portland. I mean, it's it's been challenged several times over the years and mm -hmm. people have voted to to keep it. And one of the things that they really like about it is that it spreads out the power so that the mayor doesn't have all of the executive power concentrated in in you know one pair of hands. It spreads it between multiple elected officials. Uh, so some people think that if you move away from the commissioner form of government, you have to concentrate all of the power in the, in the hands of the mayor, but that's not actually the case. There are other forms that cities use that still spread out the power. And, um, and then moving away from the commissioner system could allow you to elect your commissioners in a different way, which could change how representative they are of the mm -hmm. people. Okay, all right, so uh, talk about that because I, I think uh, you're, you're talking about wards yeah. or districts. Yep. How, how would that work in Portland? Yeah, so, um, so again, most people think that the alternative to the way we do it now, so Portland has the least representative way of electing councilors. Mm -hmm. We elect them at large in numbered seats. So everyone has to run a, a citywide campaign and they have to run for a particular numbered seat, which means they have to run against a particular opponent. Mm -hmm. um, 
So most uh, cities see, oh, the alternative is wards, where you have one person running in each ward. Mm -hmm. And that has the benefit of additional geographical representation, which is a real problem in Portland, where we've only ever had one councilor living east of 82nd. Yeah. So if there were an and east... very few even living east of the Willamette River. Even east of the Willamette River. Mm -hmm. right, like right now, it's, it's four out of five are, mm -hmm. are west of the river, even though only 20% of the population yeah. lives west of the river. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. so, so if we had an East Portland ward, of course, we would be guaranteed some uh, geographical voice on the council. But there is a, another way that cities and counties and school boards across the U.S. do this that doesn't get talked about a lot. So that was um, what my series was trying to just bring into the conversation, which is multi-member districts. Okay. All right, yeah, so describe that. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah, so multi-member district means that um, it could actually be a city-wide, like, you know, where each person would run city-wide, but instead of running for a numbered seat, they would run in a pool. And so voters would get to either rank their candidates or they would have, you know, for example, if three councillors were running at a time in a city-wide pool, voters would have three votes and they could distribute them as they wanted. So they could give one to each of three or they could give all three to one kind of underdog candidate who they really wanted to win. Mm -hmm. And what this changes is that a candidate running can run and, and can win even with non-majority support. So if they have, um, for example, if they're from East Portland and you know about 25% of people live east of 82nd, if they all really wanted an East Portlander and they all ranked that person first or gave them all three of their votes, they could elect that person even in a citywide pool. Mm -hmm. And the result is that whereas single member districts get you geographic representation, but that's it. They don't get you ideologic representation, they don't get you racial or ethnic representation, they don't get you gender representation. Yep. Mm -hmm. And this multi-member district can get you every kind of representation. So it can get you geographic if the East Portlanders want to vote in a, a block, it can get you um, more representation for people of color. So Portland has about one third people of color and we haven't had a single person of color on the council in 25 years. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And so with multi-member districts, um, people of color could get representation. Women are more likely to win under these systems we've found in other cities. So it's uh, it gives more people more voice. Okay, and and in this suggestion, they would all be running citywide still, or, or you could or you could break the city up into districts. Mm -hmm. um, you, you could do it either way. So um, I looked at a couple of different scenarios. If we had, if we kept our council at five and broke it up into a district of you know two and three, like two um, on the west side and three on the east side, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. if we expanded the council to nine, then you could do um, a three member, a three member, and a two member, which again sort of really guarantees you a certain amount of geographic representation and then additionally gives the opportunity for other groups that don't have a voice right now to have right. one. Oh, okay, all right, yeah. So you suggested enlarging the city council, <laughs> right? Which, which I've always felt, and tell me if I'm wrong, that we have a very small council based on the number of people we have in the city compared to other cities. Yeah, we do. Yeah, uh, Portland has five city councilors, including the mayor, mm -hmm. which is very small for a city of its size. So in comparison, so, so what that works out to, you know, Portland is a city of over 600,000. That means we have less than one representative per 100,000 voters. Okay. And if you look at that metric for other cities, so Seattle is a slightly bigger city than Portland, but they have 10, they have double the number of representatives. So they have two times um, the number of representatives per voter that we have. Um, Eugene has six times the number. Oakland, California, which is uh, just a little bit smaller than Portland, has three times the number. So we have, uh, voters have fewer opportunities to elect somebody who is going to give them voice mm -hmm. than voters in other cities do. Mm -hmm. and, and these other cities, do they, do they uh, elect their commissioners to, f to supervise specific bureaus or divisions of the city? No. Or is the, do, do they even supervise divisions? So, so no other big city, there's um, one small city in Washington that uses the commissioner form, but no other big city uses it. So what other cities do is some of them have um, what they call the mayor council form, where the mayor is really in charge of the executive branch, and so 
he or she is in charge of the bureaus. Um, usually, you know, uses the city manager to help him or her manage, um, but the, the, that power is concentrated in the office of the mayor. But other cities use um, what they call the council um, council manager um, form, where the councilors, just like Portland, do have some say in the oversight of the bureau. So usually they do that through um, either just a direct relationship between the council and a city manager or through um, committees. So whereas in Portland you have one parks commissioner, you know, one police commissioner, in other cities they might have like three uh, a, 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 a committee of three commissioners that are jointly making the decisions mm -hmm. um, about the parks or the transportation bureau or or whatever it is. So they still um, there's still that direct link from voter to councilor to um, what's happening with the agencies. It's just not one person. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Because in the in the ward system, yeah. uh, then quite frequently, if if I understand. Uh, commissioners would run for the district, but also to be in charge of a specific um, a bureau. Sometimes. Uh, y yes. It d yeah, it, it, w it depends. Um, sometimes. Right. Uh, at, at any rate, I if they did that, yeah. then that's a problem because yes. then they will focus the energies yes. of that department in their ward. Right. right. Yes. Yeah, and we don't really want that. No, because right. then okay. you'll have, you know, really great parks in, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the West Hills. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Okay. You mentioned, in, just in passing, uh, ranking candidates. Mm -hmm. What's that about? So the, uh, a way to get this fairer representation when you're electing more than one Councillor from a single district is to give voters the opportunity to rank them. So you know your ballot instead of just saying you know I'm casting my one vote for Ted Wheeler or Jules Bailey or Amanda Fritz, you could actually rank them one, two, three. Mm -hmm. So Ted Wheeler is my favorite, Jules Bailey is my second, Amanda Fritz is my third, and then your your vote if say say Ted Wheeler reaches the threshold to get elected and he has more than he needed to get elected, um, your vote, part of your vote, will then transfer to your next favorite candidate so that you know that everyone who got elected had some, uh, some level of support. And it means that as a, as a voter, you don't have to you know, decide, am I gonna throw my vote away on mm -hmm. somebody who I don't like as much, but I think they have the chance to win. You can rank them and then you know, the top uh, whatever it would be, if you had a multi-member district of three, the top three would get a seat. Okay, okay. And, and is, so this is this is what I used to always refer to and hear of as instant runoff voting. So instant runoff voting sort of. is is when yeah. So instant <laughs> runoff voting is also a ranked ballot, mm -hmm. but you're only electing one person. Oh uh, right. Okay. So this is a mm -hmm. multi-member ballot. So it's it's called single transferable vote. Uh, is okay. The, Okay, and is that used anywhere? It is, okay. yeah. Okay, tell us about that. <laughs> sure, so Cambridge, Massachusetts has used single transferable vote for um, more than 50 years, and they have, um, relative to their you know city size and diversity, a very diverse representative council because you can run um, even if you're kind of an underdog and you can you know get enough rankings mm -hmm. that you can get a seat. Mm -hmm. So they have, um, they've, they have had uh, African American women, they, ha they have just a better representation overall than what Portland has had. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So why should Portland think about moving from our present system? Uh, we, we talked about, well, I'm not sure, well, d d just dive into that question a little bit. We did talk about it a bit, but t dive into it a sure. little bit more. So, to me, the, the reason that I sort of started writing this series is Portland has ha Portland is one third people of color, and yet we have not had a single person of color on the council in a quarter century. Um, we're half women, and yet uh, uh, in the, of the past 25 <laughs> years, uh, you know, a less than a quarter of the years served have been by women. Um, a quarter of the people live east of 82nd, and yet we've only had one person east of 82nd. And um, renters, you know, that's, this has been a big issue in Portland, and Chloe Udaly is the first full-time renter, mm -hmm. um, you know, lifelong renter to, um, to serve on the council. So 
for democracy to work, everybody has to have a voice in, in government. And this suggests that there are big groups of people who don't have a voice in our government. Mm -hmm. And so that's um, my main focus, is making sure that everybody feels that they have some okay. power and some voice. Okay, right, and, and for Alliance for Democracy, with the mission of creating true democracy, we're right there with you yeah. on that, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and then the other reason for changing, in my view, is that we really shouldn't have commissioners in charge of bureaus mm -hmm. and doing that um, executive kind of, mm -hmm. kind of work. So. Uh, does the mayor then end up with a lot more power than he has now? Is it possible to 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 do these kind of changes and still have a mayor that is not dictator, yeah. <laughs> if you will? <laughs> Definitely, yes, it, it is possible. So um, some cities have a much more powerful mayor, mayor than Portland has, but we wouldn't have to. We, we could move away from the commissioner form of government and still spread um, that power out. So basically the, the sort of debate over you know strong mayor versus weak mayor is really about how the mayor and the council share the legislative and executive authority between them. So in some cities, the mayor really has all the executive authority. They're in charge of the agencies. They decide how things get implemented, who gets permits, all of that. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, other cities give their council some of the executive authority, so they sort of um, spread it out, like I was saying, with those committees that oh, will right. sort of mm -hmm. jointly oversee something so that um, it's not all up to the mayor. There is some, some checks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that would work more like the state legislature works with committees. W with yes. Uh, right, yeah. uh, right, okay, yeah, okay, great, okay. Um, One of the questions I have here, and you may have already answered this, so would, mm. would electing counselors from districts be better than electing them at large? Yeah, you have, but let, let's just yeah. talk about that a little more. Yeah, so like that. I said, at large is, is just really the worst way to do it. Um, you're forcing everybody to run citywide, but then you're letting them choose their opponent. So uh, you just end up with less representative results. Another thing that happens in Portland that's interesting is a lot of the council elections end with the primary. And um, so, uh, you know, of the past 10 elections, I, th I think it's like seven of them have ended at the primary, which is important because primary voters look different than general election voters. So primary voters are older, whiter, it more conservative. And so when they decide the whole race, you know, it's over, mm -hmm. then all of the, the people who, who are a little bit more representative of the general population show up at the general election and it, it's done. They don't get a say. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and part of how that happens is having at-large numbered seats. When you have an incumbent running, it's very hard to oust an incumbent. So when they run, often they don't get a strong challenger, and so they just win at the mm -hmm. primary. Um, so using multi-member districts with you know, either a ranked ballot or, or you know, being able to put all your votes on your favorite, um, changes that dynamic because now all of a sudden it wouldn't just be you know Nick Fish or Dan Salzman running for their seat against whoever mm -hmm. feels like challenging them they would actually be running against each other and against anybody oh. else who against was running other. that year yes. against oh. each other okay. right and so you know this past year when um, Amanda Fritz was running and Steve Novick was running and Chloe Daly ran against him and they, they had a few other strong challengers. Instead of Amanda Fritz just winning outright in the primary, in the general election, you would see on one ballot, Amanda Fritz, Steve Novick, Chloe Daly, and you know another challenger, mm -hmm. and you'd get to rank them. So they, you know, if you wanted to vote for both uh, both Chloe and Steve or both Amanda and you know her challenger, uh -huh. You could you could vote for both, and so it changes uh, it changes the dynamic of, of who can run and how safe they are, mm -hmm. and then it also ensures that the race always goes to the general. It never ends at the primary, and so those general voters who are more diverse 
are, are going to have a say. Okay. Is it, would there really be a reason to have a primary? Could you just do it you in, in do the general You could do away with the primary, and mm -hmm. that actually is a cost-saving measure. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it costs the city hundreds of thousands of dollars to run the primary. Mm -hmm. So without it, um, you put that money right. back in yeah. the coffers. And, 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 of course, if you have two elections, that gives, you know, major contributors, uh, influencers, yes. more opportunity to... to um, to have influence later right. on, right? Okay. And it would also, um, you know, focus all the campaign attention closer to the campaign. Whereas right now, often the really hard-fought battle is happening before the primary, before people are really paying attention yet. So um, eliminating the primary kind of shortens the campaign season and concentrates it mm -hmm. um, at the time that people are paying attention. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. So. Uh, we weren't going to talk about this, but let's talk about it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know that uh, you and Sightline uh, participated in Portland's um, public funding mm -hmm. um, open and discussion, mm -hmm. right? Open uh, and accountable election. So, talk about that. Talk about what it does, and it was implemented. Um, or it was passed, I it should was passed, say. Yes. We don't know if it's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah. Right. So. Um, Open and Accountable Elections Portland is a, uh, a public financing program to help open up the field for people who don't have a big Rolodex and don't have a lot of big donors they can call. I'm sorry, a big Rolodex. A big Rolodex. Oh, um, a lot of people with a lot of money okay, who right. they, they know or they're friends with or they're connected to who they can call and ask for. An unlimited check because yeah. in Oregon we have no contribution yeah. limits. Right. So, so someone like Phil Knight can give a half million dollars, uh, yep. uh, as he did recently to a candidate uh, right. for governor. Right, right. Okay. and that right. can be you know, you only it, you only have to make so many of those calls before you can fund your whole campaign. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're going out to town hall meetings and saying, hey, could you could you give me five bucks, ten yeah. bucks? Um, you could have a lot of support and be a strong candidate, but just not be able to raise enough money to get past the gate. Mm -hmm. So uh, Open and Accountable Elections intends to change that by saying any small donation you get, up to $50, you can get matched six to one, um, as long as you agree not to accept any donations over $250. So it's trying to give a path for people who want to run the way Jules Bailey did, not accepting checks over $250, mm -hmm. but to actually be able to be competitive with somebody who is taking those big checks. Mm -hmm. okay. And the idea for it is that right now, when you have to you know, run against somebody who's raising that much money, um, it just changes who can run a competitive campaign. You know, if, if you can't raise that much money, often you just don't even bother running or, or you know, you don't really get past the starting gate. And it changes um, how you run, right? So if you're spending your time calling up people who can write you a $10,000 check, that's a certain kind of person who can write you a $10,000 check. And you're spending more time talking to them and less time out at the town hall meetings with people who can't write those kind of checks mm -hmm. but who's whose concerns are very important to the city. Right. So by the time you finish a nine-month campaign and get into office, and then if you're going to run for re-election, you're, you're, you got to still be talking to those people, mm -hmm. it just starts to change what's top of mind for you, what you're really thinking about. Um, whereas if you can run under Open and Accountable Elections Portland, you're talking to people who can only give you five bucks, ten bucks, right. and their concerns are going to be top of mind. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and we had in this last election the the the, the uh, race for mayor of Portland with Wheeler and Bailey, and uh, talk about that difference and how this because Bailey had capped his at two hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. How did that play out for them? Yeah. So Wheeler and Bailey actually had close to the same number of donors, you know, around a thousand individuals who had supported them and given them money. Um, but because Bailey's were only up to $250 each, and um, Wheeler had some big checks, you know, $10,000 each, um, it was just a fundraising blowout. Uh, Wheeler just uh, raised many times more than Bailey was able to raise. Um, and so the idea there is that since Bailey 
was apparently running a, a somewhat similar campaign. You know, he had the same number of outreach. He, he had uh, um, about the same number of people who w believed in his campaign. And yet, he was just n not competitive mm -hmm. in that environment. So Open Elections Portland, uh, Open Accountable Elections Portland, would, you know, the idea would, it would make a candidate like Bailey competitive with those, you know, he was getting $50 donations, mm -hmm. with each of those becoming, um, 300, he would, you know, have been able to be more competitive right. in that race. And then, you know, we as voters would have had some more options on the table. Right, yeah. And, and, and in, in the open and accountable uh, elections, would all the candidates participate or would that be an option for it a candidate? It would be an option. Yeah, it would be an option. So uh, in this election we were just talking about with, with Ted uh, Wheeler, uh, he could have continued yeah. to do what he was he already have, doing. He right. could have chosen to run how he did, or he could have chosen to right. opt in. It would have been his choice. But the $250 limit that Jules placed on his would then have been matched. Uh, or, or, or uh, um, Up to $50. Up to $50, yeah. right, yeah. Right. yeah. So it would, it would have been much more beneficial. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Okay, good. I hope we'll see you back here again. All right, thank you. All right, great, yeah. So we've been talking with Kristen Eberhardt, senior researcher with Sightline Institute on ways to change Portland city government to better represent Portland residents. $500,000 is the largest single political donation to a candidate in Oregon's history, and it was made very recently by Phil Knight, Oregon's wealthiest citizen and former CEO of Nike. And he donated that to Republican planning on running for Oregon governor in 2018. Does that concern you? Well, it should. The presence of huge donations has several negative effects on our body politic and to the thinking of the Alliance for Democracy, no positive effects at all. So the Alliance for Democracy, the Oregon Progressive Party and others have begun an effort to amend the Oregon Constitution to allow limits on campaign contributions. Oregon is one of only seven states with no limits on campaign contributions. If you want to eliminate the overwhelming influence of large special interests like Mr. Knight on our elections and government, we must limit campaign contributions and expenditures. Amending the state's constitution is the first step. So we need you to join the effort. Please contact me at davidafd at ymail.com if you can help us collect signatures to qualify this for the November 2018 ballot. Again, contact me at davidafd at ymail.com and learn more about the campaign at the Portland Alliance for Democracy website, afd-pdx.org. Thank you very much for watching. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.